again, is a little bit like the English re. So punajati is again birth. And that's in the suttas, in some of the suttas? I think it comes in Dhammapada. Dukkaja jati puna puna. Yeah, but Dhammapada, I always think that's a little dodgy. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, Wait, you're, know. you're under trying to undermine 2,400... No, <laughs> a little dodgy. <laughs> I don't know. But in the pseudo-picture, do you find that? Um, I would have to do a search for it. Okay. But one does have very commonly punabhava. Punabhava means repeated existence. Yes, existence. Yeah. Or repeated becoming, becoming again and again. Did you have a question? John, John. Maybe later. It's more depending on which. Okay. Question. Any any other question? Okay. Did you? Okay. Then we'll go on with the uh, formula. Okay. So now the question comes up: What is the cause of karmic existence, or what is the cause of being or existence? And then the answer that we find in the formula of dependent origination, it's in Pali, upadana, which means literally taking up or translated as cling, clinging or grasping. And so it's through our clinging or grasping that we create fresh karma, even Usually the wholesome karma can also be motivated by clinging or grasping. Because people grasp to pleasant results, then they'll engage in wholesome karma. If people are ignorant of the law of cause and effect, then they'll engage in unwholesome karma through just simple grasping. And so this grasping is the attempt to acquire we say material possessions, sensual pleasures, as well as grasping to views, clinging to views. Okay, so what is the condition for clinging or grasping? The condition is craving. So clinging means that one grasps what one already has one holds on to what one has, and one doesn't want to let go of it, whereas craving means one wants to take possession of what one does not have. So craving is the desire for what one doesn't have, thinking, let that become mine, let me get possession of that. And then clinging is the holding to what one already has. Actually, the most basic type of clinging is the clinging to the five aggregates themselves. And so we cling, throughout our life, we cling to these five aggregates and we do all types of activities, karmic activities. And then at death, this clinging is not yet finished. And so when this body no longer can support the process of consciousness, the body falls away but that clinging is still present within consciousness, and so it grasps on to another life form. In other words, some physical organism which is just beginning to develop. And in this way, the stream of consciousness connects to that physical organism and arises again in the form of a new living being. Okay, so cling, the condition, and the condition for this clinging is craving. The craving for sense pleasures, the craving to go on experiencing, enjoying, existing in some form or another. Okay, so what is the condition for this craving? The condition is feeling. We experience feeling through the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, 
and mind, and that the pleasant feelings trigger a craving for more experience of pleasant feeling. We want to go on experiencing the same pleasures again and again. And painful feelings trigger a craving to escape from those unpleasant feelings, usually by pursuing more pleasant feelings. Or sometimes if there is a lot of oppressive pain and people try to escape from it just by completely deadening their sense, their consciousness or their sense, sense faculties. So people use alcohol and drugs when they have a lot of problems just to escape by making the mind or consciousness almost catatonic. Okay, so feeling is the condition for craving. So what is the condition for feeling? Contact. We make contact with objects. And the contact sparks feeling. How do we make contact with, with objects? Through the six sense bases, which are the six sense faculties. Eye, ear, nose, tongue, body. And then the faculty of thought or mind. Okay, how do these six sense faculties arise and develop? What is their condition? Here the text says, actually like the Pali rather better than any translation, Nama Rupa. Nama Rupa is often translated name and form. But Nama is actually, it's actually very, very similar to the English word name. They both come from the same verbal origins. But Nama doesn't literally mean name, but Nama is that aspect of the mind which is responsible. The, the way I explained it, it's that aspect of the mind which is responsible for organizing the world into a kind of systematic whole, that which assigns names and concepts to things, that which creates meaning. And so the constituents of Nama are basically feeling, perception, volitional activities. And so it's through feeling that we differentiate our, the things in the world between what is agreeable and disagreeable. Through perception, we're able to label things, to distinguish, to assign concepts to things. And it's through our volitional activities, or our disposition towards volitional activities, that we use things and that things have purposes, applications. So it's volition that makes the world instrumental in serving our purposes. And then all of this becomes the basis for our naming activities. So that's why the mental side is called nama, name. And then the bodily or physical side of experience is rupa. <clears throat> or form. <clears throat> and so it is out, this name and form begins to take shape in the mother's womb. So when the, when the ovum is fertilized, and when consciousness connects to the fertilized ovum, 
then name and form emerge together with consciousness. This means already in the embryo there is, of course there's the physical form, the body of the embryo, but already there is the mental activity of feeling, perception, and some volitional activity already beginning <clears throat> then as the organism is developing within the womb, the basic form or body of the organism starts to develop the sense faculties. The eye starts to emerge and take shape, the ear takes shape, the nose, the tongue, as well as the body. And then as the organism, when it emerges out into the world, then it has the six sense bases which become the means of making contact with the objects of the world and then through that contact arises feeling which gives rise to craving and clinging and so on. <clears throat> and so the process of becoming of existence starts when name and form begins to coagulate or to take shape within the mother's womb. So then the question comes, arises, what is it that causes name and form to take shape within the mother's womb? Why does name and form spring up in the womb? And then the answer comes, because consciousness descends into the womb or because consciousness arises based on the fertilized egg. And so when consciousness arises, then it turns the fertilized egg becomes the body of the newly emerging organism. And when consciousness connects, then feeling, perception, and volitional activities arise together with it. And then this whole interplay of consciousness and name and form continues throughout the whole embryo embryonic process and then it continues beyond that through the whole course of life. So our whole life is <clears throat> an interplay of consciousness with name and form. Consciousness with the form of the body consciousness with external form, consciousness with the factors of name, feeling, perception, volitional activities. Okay, then the Buddha raises the question, what is the origin of consciousness? Why does consciousness originate again in the mother's womb? Why does consciousness spring up and begin the life process? And why does consciousness arise in a particular situation? Why is one person born, or one being born as a human being, another being reborn as an animal, some are reborn in the heavenly worlds, the hell realms? Why does rebirth take place? And why does it take place in a particular situation? The answer the Buddha gives is because of, here it's translated formations, but now I prefer volitional activities, sankhara.
Okay, the word that's translated sankara, the Pali word is <laughs> the Pali word that's translated volitional activities is sankara. Now sankara, the word sankara, it's interesting to see how it's formed. It comes from the prefix sam, which gives the sense of together, a little bit like collect or compile, bring together. And then it's based on the verb karoti, which means to do, or to act, or to make. From the verb karoti, we get the noun karma. And we also get a word kara, which means action or activity. And so sankaras are activities that go together or activities that work together, or activities that form and construct things. And from other texts we know that these activities are basically volitional activities or intentional activities. That is, there are actions that originate from volition, from intention, And so we are forming purposes, intentions, volitions, and through those purposes and volitions, we engage in activities. And these activities create the karma, and that karma is what brings into being the new consciousness. And so the condition for the arising of consciousness is the volitional activities that we engaged in in a previous existence. And then the Buddha raises the question, what is the condition for these volitional activities? Why <clears throat> do our actions create karma? What is it that turns these activities into karmically potent forces. And to that question, the Buddha answers, it is ignorance. Ignorance means not knowing things as they really are, not knowing the true nature of things. And so because of this ignorance, we engage in various activities, sometimes unwholesome activities, sometimes wholesome activities. These, whole, these unwholesome and wholesome activities create karma. That karma brings consciousness into a particular realm of existence in the new life. When consciousness arises, it brings along with it name and form, the body, and other mental factors, out of this initial name and form, there emerge the six sense bases. Through the six sense bases, we make contact with the world. This contact gives rise to feeling. The feeling creates more craving. Through the craving, we acquire things and cling to them. Through our clinging activities, we create more karma, which brings into being a new existence. And that new existence begins with birth and ends with old age and death. And so that is the way the 12 factors hang together in sequence. I'm going to deal further with them next week. But now I'll just pass.
Okay, now I'll just ask whether there's a, there are any questions on anything that I've said so far. Subconscious choices, karma formation, since they are not intentional, but still driven by craving or aversion. <laughs> I mean, the Buddhist texts don't really speak about subconscious choices, but what we would say is that, according to Buddhism, the mind occurs very, very quickly. So what, at a coarse level, we would call a subconscious, but according to the Buddhist way of looking at it, these are actually accompanied by consciousness, but they're just occurring so quickly that they don't really register very clearly on our grosser level of consciousness. You know, like you could, let's take an example, a grosser example, somebody is a trained pianist, and so they're playing maybe a piece of music on the piano. So they're not always consciously selecting, at least it seems superficially, they're not always consciously selecting, I'm going to move from this key to that key, but they know the piece that they're playing so well. They know the piece they're playing so well that they can just go through it very quickly. And yet each note that they press is accompanied by a conscious intention. If they didn't have that intention to press this finger on that note, they couldn't get the note out of that key. Similarly, when we go, say, take a walk, we might be walking down three or four streets. We're never aware that we're lifting our foot and putting it down. Maybe I'm thinking about what I'm going to say in the lecture this morning, or I'm thinking about something that I've been working on. And so I might take a walk, a complete circle around the monastery, and I've never been aware, consciously, I say I'm not consciously aware of taking a single step unless there's something like maybe a branch on the road or some uneven space on the road, then I have to pause and consciously take the step. But otherwise I'm lost in thought, but I'm walking a 20 minute walk around the monastery. But in fact, if we really examine how the mind is working, one would say that every time I take a step, there is the intention to take that step. But the intention just goes so quickly that it doesn't register on my surface consciousness. But I'm still taking that step consciously. This is why one of the exercises in meditation is to do the walking meditation so that every step one is taking, one is doing with full awareness. Then one sees that every step, right step, left step, right step, left step, Every step takes place through conscious intention. Correct? And then somebody might be sitting and doing some knitting. This is crochet, Martin. You call it crochet? This is crochet. Yeah. 
And then she's listening to a lecture. <laughs> and she's not paying much attention to the crochet work because she's completely absorbed in the lecture. <laughs> but she knows how to do the crochet work so well <laughs> it just goes automatically so that within the space of one lecture she can knit the whole sweater or Sure. Uh, this is um, this is just going to be a, a throw for a bed. <laughs> or meditation from when it's cold. But if you give me the crochet needles and instruct me how to do crochet, I have to do every one with conscious intention. Oh yeah, like I, I taught people knitting. And they have to do it with everything. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, um, eventually it gets effortless and whatever, but at first it's really hard and you really have to concentrate on every little bit and every little minutia thing of how to really control. There's a lot of things, subtle things you can do with your fingers to control uh -huh. the thread. Eventually you don't think about it, you just do it. But uh -huh. when you teach people, you want to give them a hint. It's hard because the hands don't want to do it. Okay, we will stop now for the lunch break. Um, and I'm going to continue the sutta next week. There's a retreat here in the morning, but I'll be, and I think there'll be the class here in the morning. I want to encourage you to come for the retreat, but then I won't have a class. Are you going to have a class or not? No, I'm, I want to have the class. We also want to come to the retreat. Excuse me? I just suggest that <laughs> how to do this. I'm going on the retreat. Excuse me? I'm doing, is that the meditation retreat? It's a three days uh, called a monastic retreat. Oh, maybe I'm not it's not just straight meditation. But there are classes as well. No. I'll have to talk to Kaiti, which one am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> we talk later. <laughs> Did you just, I don't know, right? Are you, I think you were taking the meditation. The meditation, when you are registered. Okay, maybe, okay, we'll skip next week, then we'll do, take the next class on the ninth. Oh, by the way, we can have class in the library. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, but I'm just thinking if I say to people, come for the... Uh, anyway, okay, we'll have the class in the library. If you come for the retreat, you can choose either to come for the morning talk that belongs to the retreat or to my class. Sometimes you have to have like a three-ring, or two-ring circus. But don't they have a class in the library also? Regular class there? Yep. It won't be next week, because they're having that class today. Okay, now we'll send this out on the announcement that the class will be in the library. Okay, so we'll end now with the sharing of the merits, and then we'll come back after the lunch for a little discussion. Today, a fair number of people didn't come today, they usually come. They're at the other place. Oh, really? Because I also misunderstood. I thought you meant, last time you mentioned going to a library, and I wasn't sure whether you meant this time or the following time. So I went there and I saw some people. Oh, so they misunderstood them. Or they found that more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> okay, so we end with the sharing of the balance. Akasa ta chabumata, 
Oh, by the way, this is a book 